Grab your Bible for me. Go to 1 John chapter number 4. 1 John chapter number 4. I preached in Richmond Thursday night, Richmond Friday night. Thank you, Jesus. Richmond, Indiana Thursday night, Richmond, Kentucky Friday night. I got a break yesterday. I get the great opportunity to preach this morning, Lord willing, and Mosey Lowenthal tonight. And Tuesday morning, be praying for me. I fly out and will be in Eufaula, Oklahoma at an incredible camp meeting. But we have so much that's going on. I'm literally coming out of the pulpit uh, Tuesday afternoon, and they're taking me back to Tulsa, and I will be home by Tuesday night because we have a Pentecostal pavilion that's coming up. And I took a little bit of time off for a couple weeks. I'm not back on the road for a while, and everything timed out perfectly. And uh, I'm so looking forward to being there, but looking forward to being home with my church family, too, on Wednesday night, where we've been doing a sermon series on the gifts of the Holy Ghost. And it's been great. And if you were here on Wednesday night, this last Wednesday, amen. All of us got a little whooping. (laughs) That went over great, didn't it? I said all of us got a whooping. You know what that means? I came in and preached on, if you have all the gifts and have not love, the gifts are nullified and void. And I just preached it as hard as I possibly could. And that was one of the series. So I pray that you enjoyed that one. It wasn't fun, but it was good to deliver because the truth will make you free. I've had a a lot of shots in my lifetime I didn't want to have. But I'm glad after the burn and the hurt was over, it helped. Praise God. Anyway, sitting here digging myself a ditch, and I'm getting deeper and deeper in it. Praise God. Time to quit talking about that and move on. Hallelujah. (laughs) Verse number 15. Verse 15. Whosoever shall confess that Jesus is the Son of God, God dwells in him and he in God. And we have known and believed the God that... uh, Hold on a second here. Thank you, Jesus. And we have known and believed the love that God to us, God is love. And he that dwelleth in love dwelleth in God and God in him. Herein is our love made perfect that we may have boldness in the day of judgment. Because as he is, so are we in this world. Verse number 18, I love. There is no fear in love. Let me just act like I'm preaching that right here. There's no fear in love. Let me say it again. There's no fear in love. But perfect love casteth out fear because fear hath torment. He that feareth is not made perfect in love. We love him because he first loved us. I'm preaching for a few moments today because fear hath torment. Push your neighbor and grit your teeth and say, I hope he preaches this good. Because somebody going to need what he's preaching. Some of y'all don't know how to grit your teeth. Well, just tell your neighbor. I hope he preaches good on this. Father, I love you today. I thank you for your mercy and your grace that extends to our lives and beyond. And we give you praise, thanks, honor, and glory. In the name above every name. And everybody said amen and amen. Y'all know what to do. Clap your hands and... Come on, give God some praise. Come on, come on. I want to preach for a few moments on fear. The definition of torment is severe physical or mental suffering. If there are those of you that are sitting under the sound of my voice and beyond technologically today, and you are experiencing symptoms of severe physical or mental suffering. It could be the fact that you are dealing with a spirit of fear that has torment as a cousin. When you get under fear and or torment, you become vulnerable when you allow torment to come in and stay there and reside there. You enlarge that vulnerability Ability when you allow that fear to dominate your mindset. I'm going to say something cautiously. I'm going to say it respectfully because I want you to hear my heart. I'm convinced, absolutely convinced, that some people are miserable and simply put, they're just tormented by the enemy of their life. I run across people all day. I'm in and out of people's lives constantly. I'm in and out of places that I run across people 
every single day of my life. I put myself out there. I realize that I'm perhaps a bit different than some apostles or bishops or pastors, that I'm accessible. Uh, I, don't, I don't run away from people after service. I get confronted by people that have issues or problems or, or simply difficulties. I want to pray for them. I want to help them. I want to be a shepherd that smells like sheep. Not one that smells like pride and arrogance. So I'm telling you today that there are people, I believe, that are driven to a spiritual grave because of fear and because of torment. They're miserable. You see the look in their face, the oppression, the depression, um, perhaps, and they're miserable. I don't believe that a Christian can be demon-possessed. That is a misnomer. There's no way you can be saved and full of God and be possessed by a devil at the same time. No absolute way. I do, however, I do, however, believe in oppression, which means that you're not possessed or filled with, but you can be oppressed by things. That things can just push on you and that things you can feel like walls are coming in on you. But that's different than possession. The definition of fear is an unpleasant emotion caused by the belief that someone or something is dangerous, likely to cause pain or a threat. We have to be very careful when you deal with the spirit of fear. The Bible calls it a spirit of fear because you open doors oftentimes for, for opportunity for the enemy to come in. You have to be cautious about opening a door for torment to invade your life. You do this by allowing generational curses to stay, unforgiveness to remain, judging people, being critical of people. God, I really need your help to preach this. And so I'm going to ask you to help me, Lord. Pride and abuse, just to name a few things that can come in that, that turn into fear and worry and torment. The Bible says in Exodus 14, 14, the Lord shall fight for you and you shall hold your peace. Evidently, somebody got afraid and fear started to develop and torment came in and Exodus 14, 14 said, hey, hey, the Lord shall fight for you and you shall hold your peace. Mark 12 and verse 10, the stone which the builders rejected is become the head of the corner. So if you ever think in your life that you're the only one that has ever felt any ounce of rejection, Jesus did. And the Bible said he has become the head of the corner. 2 Timothy 1 verses 1 to 7 speaks of the spirit of fear. Fear is paralyzing. Fear is gripping and paralyzing and shuts down your system and puts you in bondage. I have watched people under intense amounts of fear and when they get under intense amounts of fear, they either pass out or they start to get paralyzed and can't finish their statements because fear grips them. Come on, God, and help me preach this. Fear is a destiny killer. When fear freezes up your faith, it kills your destiny. Fear of future is a destiny killer. How can you go where you've never been being able and afraid to go there when God says, I'm sending you here? It was a Monday night late. It was Julia McFadden's family that's over here. A precious niece, I believe it was, Julia, if I'm not mistaken, that had been in multiple ERs and they had already started running scans on her brain because they could not figure out why she couldn't talk. Her English was shut down. Her words were slurred. Her hands were gripped tight, just like this. And when she walked, it was minimal steps when they brought her on Tuesday morning before a prayer meeting. They had done everything. They had taken her to every place possible and they finally called the church on a Monday night in a panic and said, we understand you're having a prayer meeting tomorrow. We have done everything with our daughter that we can do that at the time must have been her late teens or her early 20s, if I remember correctly. And they said, we'd like to bring her over and have you pray for her. Her hands are twisted up. Her body is knotted up. She can't hardly walk. And when she tries to talk, nothing comes out. 
Doctors can't understand what's wrong with her. They've tried to medicate her, but nothing will fix this, Pastor. I'm losing my daughter, and we need God to move on her behalf. And I said, bring her over in the morning at 9 o'clock, and we will have prayer for her. I was in the office, understood that they got her out of the car from up here close to around the turnabout is. And she started walking real slow and they walked her inside the door and they stood her over by the trash can. And I told the prayer meeting, you all go ahead and have prayer. I told her mother and her mom's boyfriend, I said, you guys stay in the lobby. I'm taking her with me. And Ada came and Ron Steckenfinger came and I can't remember who else was there. But we went back there and for 50 minutes, I started counseling and talking to her and trying to help her. And I said, what happened to her to the mom before we took her back there? And, and they said she had an extreme altercation with a man that was put in prison some years ago. And we took her to a tractor supply, if I'm not mistaken. And when she walked in, she seen this man was released from prison and fear gripped her and they had to get her in the car. They said, that's the only thing we can think of. And in the spirit of God began to speak to me, a spirit of fear has latched onto her and invaded her life and torment has walked in and she can't even say a word. We got her in the back. We started praying for her. I started speaking the name of Jesus over her life. Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. God, I know you are able to rid her of this fear and this doubt and this worry. And I would say to her, say Jesus. And she'd look at me and say, yeah, but it couldn't come out. And her hands were like this. And finally, after 33 minutes of praying, all at once, Jesus came out of her mouth. And right after that, Jesus came out of her mouth. And right after that, Jesus came out of her mouth. And right after that, Jesus, Jesus, Jesus started rolling out of her mouth. I know what that spirit of fear can do. I got a hold of her hands and asked Ada. When I grabbed her hands and peeled her fingers back, she pulled them back as fast as she could and began to moan with pain. And I said, no, 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 no. I said, your fingers are going to break loose today. You're not getting a 25% deliverance. You're getting a 100% deliverance. I said, you're going to open them hands up in the name of Jesus. That devil that's tormenting you is going to get out of this church today. He is coming out of your life right now. I said, furthermore, you're going to walk out of this church and you're not going to come in in baby steps anymore and within 10 minutes she opened up her hands within 15 minutes she's raising her hands 20 more minutes and she's walking around the fellowship hall because fear is a liar Woo! push your neighbor shout preach on pastor fear is a destiny killer there was a little rabbit, there's four of them. I walked out the other day and I look over to my right and in our flower bed that, that is, has beautiful greenery just growing like mad all over. I look in there because I come out my front door and all of a sudden there's four little baby rabbits and they're just scurrying trying to hide. Jill and Carly were taking a walk the other day and came home and Jill said, oh honey, it was so funny. That little rabbit, we came up on it and it didn't know we were there and it took off running and once it saw us, it just froze in midair just like this because that's what fear will do. It doesn't just torment people, it torments animals, it torments nature when fear tries to grip your life. I'm gonna preach, you, I'm gonna preach on you, lying devil. You just back up. I'm going to preach on. Somebody going to get delivered today. I'm going to preach on. When they called me to be a sales rep for a trucking company, whoo, I feel myself rocking now. Hallelujah. Oh, I got internal indicators that something's about ready to happen. When they called me to be a sales rep and I had one single suit, it was olive green. I remember when I walked in there and we started training and I started doing sales and I started calling on people. I was told, you gotta go back. You have to go back and continue to service and maintain the account. I thought, well, I thought I just had to go one time and sell it and walk away and they said, no, because other reps will come in and try to take what you got. You gotta go back. 
All of a sudden, people started giving us lots of freight. Lots of movement started to happen. Started making money. God started blessing. I said, thank you, Lord. And then they said, you need to take that guy out to lunch. I said, I don't know him. I'm 24, 25 years old. I didn't know this guy. Oh, yeah, you got to take him out to lunch. I want you to take him out. I want you to go buy him a lunch. Take him wherever he wants to. And I thought, this is crazy. I'm not letting some strange person get in my car. I was afraid. Fear gripped me. What am I going to say to this man for an hour and a half? I don't know his family. I don't know anything about these people. But I've got to do this. And fear started gripping me and I lost some sleep at night. And one morning I got up and I said, wait a minute. I am a child of the king. Why am I so afraid of getting a free lunch at wherever I want to go, which includes steaks and ribs and fried chicken, baby? Come on. And all of a sudden I went into the office the next day and I said, they want me to take somebody to lunch? I'm going to take somebody to lunch. And for the next two weeks, 10 days in a row, Monday through Friday, I called and scheduled every lunch I could. I said, you're going to do this until you get so comfortable that it's going to be second nature. And for two weeks I enjoyed myself and had free lunch. I took my 12 inch soul and kicked the devil right in the head and said to God be the glory. And from there we traveled all over the country free golf outings and trips because God knows what he's doing don't you back down from what God called you to do don't you back down from the destiny that God has provided oh oh, I said I wasn't going to try but I'm going to preach now I'm just going to try to teach a little bit but I but I feel the preacher coming up out of me come on somebody stand up and touch 10 people and tell them don't you let fear kill your destiny Oh, Tony, I feel like preaching. Woo. Come on, high five a couple people and shout, preach on, you're helping me. Can I tell you one more of my favorites? Can I tell you one more of my favorites? Harry James. Harry James was a monster when I was a little kid. And he had a big black gorilla suit and a mask. And he lived at my grandma's house in Phillipsburg on Hartman Road. And at nighttime, he walked around the house in that mask in a gorilla suit. And I thought Harry James was real. And in my childhood, they showed me Harry James at the window. And I wanted to crawl underneath the table. Scared the life out of me nearly. And I saw this often. Until one day I went into my grandma's closet and I seen Harry James' coat on the rack all the way to the floor. And I said, is there really a Harry James? But it got so deep in my spirit that she lives out in the country and there's no street lights. And when they turn off the porch lights and you go outside and try to get you a green apple from the apple tree. Cause when I was a little boy, I used to sit in the fork of an apple tree and I'd eat one after another. And I had dozens, dozens of green apples. And I ate the worms and the core and I survived. Can I tell you something else I survived? Belt whoopings. Switches. I had to say a little something to push us a little bit today. And I'm telling you forever, all I could see was Harry James, his hairy body. All I could see was his awful mask. And one day when I got about 10 or 11 years old, I said, I'm sick and tired of this, Nicholas. And I went up to Grandma's house on Hartman Road in Phillipsburg. And I got to Grandma's house and I waited till it got good and dark outside. I waited till the full moon was gone. I waited till, I mean, it was pitch black. And I stayed all night with my grandma because in the morning you'd wake up to scratchy W-O-N-E A-M radio. Hallelujah. They'd play old country music. George Jones would be singing and I knew when I got up I was going to have French toast and scrambled eggs and sausage. Hallelujah. Did I mention that I'm hungry? 
And so I got to where it was dark outside and old fear started coming up on me. What you going to do now? You said you were going to walk around the house. I said, I'm going to. I'm waiting on it to get good and dark. It got good and dark and the 10 o'clock news come on. And I popped up off the Davenport. That's a couch. Davenport's old country terminology. I got up off the Davenport. I said, Grandma, I said, take me to the front door. We're going to walk through the breezeway. I'm going to go out the outside door. I want you to lock the doors and turn off every light outside. What are you doing? Toddy boy, what are you doing? I said, I'm going to go outside and if Harry James shows up, I'm going to beat the devil out of him. If Harry James doesn't show up, there's no Harry James. And I got to walking outside and Brother William, I got about 10 feet off the porch and old Harry James' spirit came up on me and said, I'm Harry James. I said, I don't see you, Harry James, because I got the Holy Ghost on the inside and I've got the spirit of the Lord on the inside and my spirit is greater than your spirit and the Holy Ghost God gave me is greater than your spirit oh would somebody stand up and shout it is time for you today to overcome your fear that breeds torment it's time to step out in what God called you I feel a run in my soul is there anybody take a run right now it might be good Oh, let's give God praise. Come on, let's give God praise. Come on, stand up and say, I'm not going to die. Stand up and say, I'm not going to be sick. Stand up and say, I'm not going to find any lumps and bumps. Stand up and say, if God be for me, who can? Spirit of fear mixes the spiritual aspect. The enemy wants to freeze up your spirit because fear paralyzes. Fear is in direct conflict with your faith. Fear wants to smother it and choke it out. Faith and fear is like oil and water. They do not mix. Fear creates doubt, which creates confusion, which leaves you second guessing everything. What faith brings in and what fear brings in. There are great things brought into your life by faith. And as much as there are unfortunate things that are brought into your life by fear. For example, when people say, I was afraid that would happen. Instead of the opposite, which says, I was believing God would do that. We start talking on the natural saying, I was afraid that would happen. Let me just use some bad terminology. You afraided that thing right into your life is what you did. What does fear look like if if spirit had a natural body? Fear looks like every negative thing that the enemy puts in your mind that will be outcome in your life. Fear looks like murder. Fear looks like cancer. Fear looks like a coffin. Fear looks like a casket. Fear looks like your obituary. Fear looks like uh, the undertaker. Fear looks like you in a casket in a wagon going to the funeral and going to the cemetery after the service. That's what fear looks like. Fear looks like death. Fear always takes. Fear always steals. It kills. It destroys. And it takes away from every God-given good thing that he ever sent into your life because fear is a liar. Your supernatural faith is greater than the apparel of Solomon. Your level of trust and faith in God is greater than the apparel of Solomon and all of his glory. Your faith is beautiful to Jesus. He explained it that way. Build something beautiful to the Lord. I want you to consider the lilies. Consider them. It's amazing to see how year after year over a bulb in the dirt, they keep coming back. But what does the Bible say about the word of God? It's a seed. And you know what a seed does, don't you? Seed goes into the darkest place of the earth. Earth, and somehow it gets surrounded by a dirty, filthy, stinking mess. But it grows in dirty, stinking, filthy messes. What is our righteousness is as filthy rags. What is our flesh? It stinks in the nostrils of God. But let me tell you what the seed of the word does. It goes into the darkest place of humanity called your flesh. And when it gets down there where it's good and dirty and smelly, it starts to open up and blossom. Ain't nobody helping me now tell your neighbor I'm glad for the word of the Lord that got in my life (laughs) 
Lilies don't toil. And they don't spin. Toil means to grow weary, tired, exhausted. Don't get tired. You don't go out in your yard and look at your lilies and they go, help. I'm so discouraged today. They don't do that. They just keep on growing. They don't get tired. They don't get weary. The team and the bulb says, keep pushing, keep pushing, keep pushing. Spring's here. Keep pushing. Summer's here. Let me ask you the question. What are you worried about? What are you worried about? Can a man change his stature? Can a man change the measure of who he is? Can a man do anything by worrying about it? By being stressed out about it? Can he change anything? Come on, I'm talking to you, saints. Come on, somebody, please talk back to me. Stop thinking and just talk back to me. What are you worried about? What problem is so big that God can't fix it? What valley is so deep that God can't span it? What mountain is so high that God can't help you over it? What problem is there that you got that he can't take you through it? And the answer is nothing. Shall be able to separate? us from the love of God with God